Hey everybody, welcome to the channel. I'm here to talk to you about Thomas Sowell in a reaction video called The Men Who Betrayed MLK. Now, if you've seen the film, Uncle Tom 2, then you know that we're not really huge fans of MLK. So check out that film, but he is still a very influential man in American history. And so, but the people that are today that you see there in this thumbnail, the men who betrayed him, Al, Jesse, these guys, well, they are much different now than what they were then. And King in some ways is different to what people who identify with him in terms of his struggle are today. Because if you think about it, he was talking about, hey, measure me by the content of my character, who I am as a person, not by the brownness of my skin. Whereas we all know that liberals don't think that way anymore. It's all about being brown. If you're brown, you don't have to do anything. Just be brown and we'll take care of you. You don't have to do anything, have a skill, nothing. You can just get into Harvard and basically have a C average, no big deal, because you know what? You're underprivileged, you're brown, you deserve to get in because you can't really do it on your own. So anyway, let's check out this video. It's about four minutes long, let's check it out. You've mentioned a couple of times how you say things and think differently than others. Mm -hmm. and. I want to read, it'll take me just a minute here, to read this paragraph and ask you to explain it further. This is deep in the book, uh, and when I read it, it kind of popped out, and I wanted to ask you uh, what you meant by all this. So any fundamental re-examination of the assumptions behind preferential policies, that's the name of the book, and still more so, any resulting change of policies can expect to encounter their vocal, bitter, and determine opposition, including inevitable charges of racism against outsiders, labels of traitor put on any members of their own group who disagree with them, uh, who disagree publicly with them, and whatever other claims or charges seem likely to be. It is taking him a long time to get to this question. Be politically effective. When you said labels of traitor put on any members of their own group who disagree publicly with them, are you talking about yourself? Only as one among many. Uh, Randall Kennedy up at Harvard did a very uh, fine article in the Harvard Law Review last June, for which he was denounced as an academic minstrel and other things because he was out of step. I mean, people who... who academic minstrel, what he's referring to, is basically minstrel shows, which is basically sample images of black people who are basically degenerates. It was the turn of the century, mostly. It was minstrel shows. You can Google it and check it out for yourself. But basically, it's calling him a sellout because he's out of step with them imagining what the typical liberal blacks, Marxists of today think. Who raise their heads uh, will set off a search and destroy mission because uh, people have a lot at stake and they're sitting on a house of cards. They have many assumptions which simply cannot be examined carefully because those assumptions will collapse and they'll fall from a very high position to a very... By the way, this looks like this took place in 1990, it looks like. So, yeah, this is a, a long time ago. But, and by the way, the 90s, by the way, it was actually a good time for black people. We actually weren't blaming the white man as much as we are today. It was about uplifting uh, the community, about doing for ourselves, not lingering on the tent of society and being able to provide. Sure, things have changed since then, but even then, they were called people who were looking out for the community at a level above that sellouts, which is interesting. Low position, and they are not about to tolerate people uh, questioning what they're saying. Is there a way for you to put it in a nutshell about what people of, say, your own race mm -hmm. say about you that they don't like what you say oh, about Oh, wait, wait. Uh, I, think, I think one of the, one of the ways that the uh, organized noisemakers have succeeded in saying that what they're saying is what their race is saying. My like you said, organized noisemakers. I like that. I have to remember that. My race is not saying that about me. Those particular individuals who are a small minority of themselves within the black community, who have a vested interest in many of these programs, they are saying that. But when I checked out of my hotel this morning, you know, the black uh, uh, security guard come, came over and said, are you sold? And I said yes, and he shook my hand warmly, and we walked. He walked me the length of the corridor and talked about this and about that, and that's not at all an uncommon experience for me. So it's not soul versus blacks; it's the black intellectuals 
And the black intellectuals are no more typical of the black population than white intellectuals are of the white population. These black intellectuals, the Jessies, the... I wouldn't put Maxine Waters in that category because she's not an intellectual. But the Al Sharptons, and you can go into even at a higher level, you know, Cornell West, or even Brother Jabrari, he debated uh, Kingface. And those people like that are really, really, you know, well, I'll let Thomas Holt tell you for himself. Uh, but they have a very large vested interest in certain beliefs which, which underlie various programs from which they benefit enormously. And as I point out in the book, this is common around the world, that the elites benefit from preferential programs, even when those programs are in the name of the masses. The masses do not benefit. In the case of the current so-called Civil Rights Act, the masses are going to lose big if that law goes into effect. Why? Did you hear that? So he's basically saying, and we've said before in most of uh, the content pertaining to, I mean, pertaining to Thomas Sowell, is that these elites, these, in this case, black elites, benefit way more than the people they're supposed to be helping. Why is that? It's because they should be working themselves out of a job in terms of them helping the community come up. As they come up, there should be less of a need for those people who are helping. Otherwise, you're not helping. I mean, how long do you need a tutor before you need to fire your tutor when you don't get your, you know what I'm saying? At some point in time, if you're looking to do something in terms of schooling and you can't read and you have a tutor for 40 years, well, that teacher, teacher should have been fired like you know, 39 years ago. That's what I'm trying to say. And these people need to be working themselves out of a job, but they're not because there's no incentive for them. Otherwise, they lose their power, their position, and whatnot. Because employers will not want to hire as many blacks in the jobs for which most blacks... Let's back up a little bit here. This is common around the world that the elites benefit from preferential programs, even when those programs are in the name of the masses. The masses do not benefit. In the case of the current so-called Civil Rights Act, the masses are going to lose big if that law goes into effect. Why? Because employers will not want to hire as many blacks in the jobs for which most blacks will be applying, because those will not be jobs as rocket scientists or as doctors or, as any, or any of those things. And therefore, they'll want to hold down percentages down there uh, to what they can do uh, in the higher ranks, which is going to be much less. Uh, and so, you'll, so you're sacrificing the working class blacks for the benefit of the professional elite. How do they? That is really incredible. And we know the recent decision by the Supreme Court to essentially eradicate affirmative action was partially because of this. I mean, it does the opposite. People, if they say, okay, well, I can only hire... I have to hire a certain number of blacks. Well, I'm going to hire the people that I know can do the job. I'm not going to hire black people in that position because they're, just, they're not. And so, like you're saying, they're going to sacrifice the labor of the working class jobs for the elites in those jobs. And so that is a problem because what you're doing is you're forcing the employer to make a moral decision based on skills that that person may or may not have. But the priority is on how they look and not what they bring to the table and ultimately what you're paying them for. Intellectual elite, both white and black, get to the position that they do in this country that you disagree with. I mean, how, how do they have the influence they have? Well, no, but how, what, what, what's their, th from what your discussions over the years, what's their thought process that gets them there? Is it emotion or is it fact? Emotion largely, but also a large amount of self-interest, increasingly self-interest. I think that if you went back, you know, into the 60s, you'd find people with different views like Martin Luther King or Malcolm X. But I think that both those men believed in what they said. Uh, whereas today, you have people who are simply professional hustlers. And again, this is not peculiar to blacks or peculiar to the United States or even peculiar to racial issues. That organizations typically, many movements are set off by idealistic people who want to promote some good for mankind or for some group. But as time goes by and as they succeed, they'll be followed by people who can use these things for their own self-interest. And that's been the history of regulatory agencies in the government. Uh, it's been the history, of, I think, of, uh, of religions, that the, uh, the first Christians who were being persecuted by the Roman Empire were not in it you know, for what they could get because all they were going to get is trouble. But once Christianity became the state religion, this became a very lucrative career for some people. Uh, and then you get an entirely different kind of person coming in at that point and we have an entirely different kind of movement.
Very, very good point. So the men that betrayed MLK, just to bring it into focus, because that's what you came here for, was very basically simply this, was that MLK and people like Malcolm X as well, and other, I call them ideologues, or people who are really in it for what they believe, that cause or purpose, well, that's the first generation. And what he's saying is the men that betrayed MLK are these guys right here. Now, there's a good story about Jesse Jackson. I don't have a time to talk about this. It's related to the assassination. Jesse was sort of there. He was on the scene, but it's a whole nother story. Maybe when you, if you come onto the channel and join as a member at any level, I'll tell the story of that and give my reaction to that particular story. It's very interesting of how Jesse got his, has more or less his start. And it was basically literally off the blood of MLK. But neither here nor there, these people betrayed in terms of what the purpose and I guess mindset of what MLK, and especially Malcolm X, that movement, because they went into it for themselves and doing it for themselves meant they were trying to line their own pockets. And of course, it goes back to what I said about they're not working themselves out of a job, they're working for themselves for their own interests, money, power, esteem, whatever. So you guys, that's my take on this. And I think that's accurate. And I think that's actually uh, the point that these people, these race hustlers, these Cornell West, Jesse Jackson's, Al Sharpton's need to be shunned, they need to be ignored. And we need to lift up other people who have better ideas that are based in common sense.